Hello, everyone. I'm Marcia McNutt, President of the National Academy of Sciences, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here to the annual awards ceremony for the National Academy of Sciences. At this presentation, we will recognize 23 individuals for their contributions to science. But before we begin giving out the awards, we have a special presentation entitled A Centenary of the Discourse on the Oceans. His Supreme Highness, Prince Albert II of Monaco is going to present brief remarks celebrating the 100 year anniversary of a talk that his great great grandfather, Prince Albert I gave at the National Academy of Sciences at the time at which he was being awarded the Alexander Agassi Medal for his contributions to oceanography. And now the Prince. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished members of the Science Academy. The American nation is rapidly growing in the midst of mankind like a splendid fruit ripened with the intelligence and labor of modern generations. It was with these words that my great-great-grandfather, Albert I, launched a century ago today, his famous discourse on the ocean. It is with these words, in responding to your invitation, for which I am honored, that I wish to revive the memory of his action, to briefly evoke a document that remains a founding text on the future of our planet, and to recall the warm welcome your country gave him. During his third and last stay in the United States, Albert I of Monaco received two prestigious awards, the Cullen Medal and the Agassiz Medal. It was on this occasion, on April 25, 1921, at the National Museum in Washington, before the assembly of the Science Academy, that he gave his famous speech. In paying tribute from the outset to an ideal of peace and civilization, more than ever indispensable in the aftermath of the First World War, Prince Albert I delivered the scientific testament of a life of curiosity for all living things. Albert I, in fact, was taking stock of his work in physical oceanography, marine meteorology, and marine biology. Thirty years of research, from the Arctic to Cape Verde, led him to explore the abyss, to demonstrate the possibilities of life in hitherto unknown depths, to clarify the direction of the North Atlantic currents, to become aware of the infinite resources of the ocean, particularly in the field of medicine. My great-great-grandfather drew particular attention to the conservation of multiple species, both fauna and flora. The Oceanographic Museum of Monaco, which he founded, shows this wealth to its visitors. The Oceanographic Institute in Paris, which is located next to the Sorbonne, assists visitors in understanding it. But the prince's curiosity did not stop there. Always concerned about security and understanding between nations, he called for international regulatory bodies for the high seas and alerted public opinion to the dangers of floating mines after the end of the war. The humanist in him was never far away. A final and perhaps the most important point is made in his ocean discourse. Reflecting on his own practices, he strongly condemned hunting, poaching, and mass killings. He applied the same consideration to fishing. Long lines and nets were converted to serve only to bring back undocumented specimens for scientific study. With astonishing foresight, Albert I was already denouncing the destruction and excesses of overfishing. I quote him, Now I shall take up a matter which is one of a really serious nature. I mean fishing generally, the destructive effects of which are becoming greater and greater in the seas where more and more powerful and numerous implements, such as steam trawlers, are being used. The latter now graze the very soil of continental plateaus, plucking off the seaweeds and ruining the bottoms that are fittest for the breeding, as well as the preservation of a great many species. Even though in his lifetime environmental concerns were not yet as serious and urgent as they are today, my great-great-grandfather foresaw the threat of extinction of species, drawing attention to the situation of the fauna, but also to, to the fragility of plants, an essential resource. Once again, Prince Albert I saw only one solution, concerted action at an international level to gather men in the worship of justice, of labor, and of liberty. What was worthwhile yesterday is even more worthwhile today. The damage caused by the deep sea and intensive fishing is now rallying non-governmental and intergovernmental bodies. Ocean pollution, 
the disappearance of species and rising water levels due to climate change are major challenges for hundreds of millions of men and women. My commitment to the preservation of the oceans is well known. I owe it in large part to Prince Albert I. I carry this heritage within me and in guiding my country's policy, I strive to participate in awareness reigning and warning policies and actions to defend the environment both within my country and internationally. In order to give them greater scope globally and locally, I've launched my foundation, which contributes to a number of programs, many of which concern the ocean, including the elimination of plastic waste, which as we all know, is a monumental problem. We must therefore act relentlessly in favor of the marine environment to restore damaged ecosystems and to better protect the fragile ones so that they continue delivering the extraordinary services that they are able to provide to us on this, our blue planet. 100 years later, the discourse on the ocean can continue to be a guide and a path for us to follow. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the Prince for his inspiring remarks about the importance of ocean conservation. So first up in our awards this afternoon are the Cazzarelli Prizes. These prizes are named in honor of a former editor-in-chief of PNAS, Nick Cazzarelli. The prizes are awarded annually to six research teams with the six prizes representing the six classes in the academy, which spans uh, all of our um, scientific divisions. The first prize is uh, for class one, mathematical and physical sciences, and it's being awarded for the paper, Universal Free Energy Landscape Produces Efficient and Reversible Electron Bifurcation. Electron bifurcation is a process encountered in biological reaction networks, such as nitrogen fixation and carbon dioxide reduction. The principles that suppress energy dissipating reactions that might occur in bifurcating networks have long been unclear. The authors of this article report that efficient bifurcation emerges naturally in a free energy scheme with two steep electron transfer pathways branching from the bifurcating site. This work could guide efforts to create synthetic electron bifurcation systems. So congratulations to the winners of the class one award. Class two is biological sciences. And the award is being given for the paper, B2 and ALU retro transposons are self-cleaving ribozymes whose activity is enhanced by EZH2. Now ribozymes are RNA segments that act as enzymes, but their physiological functions have often been unclear. The authors of this article examined 82 elements which produce RNA that is cleaved through interaction with the protein EZH2 and that activates genes implicated in heat stress. The findings suggest that B2 elements, as well as their human analogs called ALU elements, are epigenetic ribosomes, which are molecular switches activated during stress. Congratulations. Now for class three, which is Engineering and Applied Sciences. The paper that is being awarded the Cazzarelli Prize is uh, titled, A Scalable Pipeline for Designing Reconfigurable Organisms. Using artificial intelligence, the authors of this article developed a process for designing synthetic organisms. The authors used a cell-based construction kit and stem cells from frogs to create the organisms. They designed and evolved in silico structures capable of locomotion, object manipulation, and object transport. And the fabricated cellular structures emulated the form and function of the in silico designs, suggesting an array of applications from precise drug delivery to environmental remediation. Congratulations. Next is class four, Biomedical Sciences for the paper HIV-1 uncoats in the nucleus near sites of integration. 
During infection, the human immu immu immunodeficiency virus must disassemble the capsid coat surrounding its viral DNA before incorporating the DNA into the host genome. However, the intracellular locomotion and timing of the viral uncoating have been unclear. In this work, the authors found that viral cores enter the nucleus intact or nearly intact, and that uncoating occurs near the genomic integration site within one and a half hours of integration. The findings provide insight into HIV-1 behavior upon entering the human cell. So congratulations to the winners of the class four prize. Next, class five, behavioral and social sciences. This prize is given for the paper titled Physician-Patient uh, Racial Concordance and Disparities in Birthing Mortality for Newborns. Studies show racial disparities in infant mortality find that black newborns die at three times the rate of white newborns. The authors of this article examined records of 1.8 million hospital births in Florida and found that when black newborns received care from black physicians, the mortality disparity with white newborns was reduced by half. The findings identify the scenarios in which patient physician racial concordance may prove beneficial. So congratulations. Uh, and last up is class six, um, which is applied biological, agricultural and environmental sciences. The prize in class six is given for the paper, fast behavioral feedbacks make ecosystems sensitive to pace and not just magnitude of anthropogenic environmental change. Human driven environmental changes can alter animal behavior and species demographics. In this article, the authors used data on the foraging behavior of herbivorous fish in a coral reef, as well as demographic estimates to develop an ecosystem model. The model revealed that the ecosystem was susceptible to the magnitude of changes in fishing pressure, as well as the pace of change. The findings suggest that rapid changes can collapse an ecosystem that would persist under gradual change. So congratulations to the authors of all of these outstanding papers. Now we will present the National Academy of Sciences Awards for 2021. The first is the Arctosi Medal, which is awarded to Dana W. Longscope of Montana State University in Bozeman. This prize is given for fundamental research on the nature of solar magnetism, magnetic topology and reconnection, providing a, a unified framework for understanding the energization and dynamics of quiet sun, active regions, flares, and coronal mass ejections. Thank you. I am profoundly grateful to the National Academy of Sciences and to my colleagues for honoring me with the Arktowski Medal. I thank the Arktowski family for their generosity to space science. Every day, I feel incredibly fortunate to be given the opportunity to engross myself in work I thoroughly enjoy, scientific research and teaching. The only thing more rewarding than unraveling a fresh scientific puzzle is sharing it with my colleagues and my dedicated students. I've benefited immeasurably from the work of the field's pioneers, including Eugene Parker, Jack Harvey, and Jack Gosling. I'm humbled to be added to the list of Arktowski, Arktowski medalists um, along with them. Over my career, I've been supported by and mentored by a number of colleagues. I'd like to single out Eric Priest, Lauren Acton, Dick Canfield, George Fisher, Hank Strauss, and Ravi Sudan, who've patiently supported me as I found my way in science. I've also been supported by my wonderful family, especially my wife, Valerie, my father, Christopher, and my mother, Julia. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dana, for those remarks. Uh, the next award that we're pleased to give is the Gilbert Morgan Smith Medal, and it's awarded to Patrick Keeling of the University of British Columbia. And it's being awarded for his leadership in developing, implementing, and promoting ways to assess algal and protestin uh, diversity for investigations into the evolution of genomes of algal-derived organelles, endosymbionts, and parasites in the role of gene transfer. 
for advances in algal systematics and for deep insights into the biochemical and genetic processes affecting global biogeochemistry. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> I'll also start um, by thanking my family. Um, they've been very supportive this year. I've seen them a lot this year and uh, it's been one of the silver linings. I was thinking about how I got here. I got into microbiology by mistake. I was actually a mediocre student who signed up for microbiology because I've confused it with molecular biology. And then I got into marine biology and algal biology through parasitology. So my path has been more of a pinball than a arrow. And um, I owe a lot to the influential people that I've bounced off uh, along the way. Susan Covell and R.G. Murray got me hooked on microbiology at first and in and, and the true diversity of, of biological diversity. Ford Doolittle and Mike Gray uh, taught me about endosymbiosis and about evolution and there really couldn't be anybody better to learn from. Jeff McBen and Jeff Palmer introduced me to plastids and algal uh, biology. And again, um, I, I couldn't have been more lucky so these people were all brilliant. I was privileged to work with them um, and, and they've set me on this path. But I wanna emphasize that I still wouldn't have really gone anywhere if it weren't for all the brilliant people that have then uh, come and worked with me in my lab. So the students and the postdocs uh, that make all the great discoveries. Um, it's, it's really down to these young people where we've gone. And I wanna emphasize that uh, I owe a lot to them and I, I hope that I've been a good mentor to them as well. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. All right, our next award is the Henry Draper Medal, and it's being awarded to Shepard Dolomon of the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard and the Harvard Smithsonian, and to Heino Falk of Ratbout University at Nijmegen. Hi, uh, thank you to the National Academy for this great honor. It's truly humbling uh, to see the list of prior recipients of the Draper Medal. Is it odd to devote one's career to imaging and studying something that is almost defined to be invisible? My family definitely thinks so. Uh, but resolving the ring of light around a black hole predicted by general relativity had immediate impact across the sciences. And seeing the image on the front page of every major newspaper also revealed a truly human dimension to the project, a connection with our basic urge to explore and understand the deepest mysteries. I wanna give special thanks to a few groups. First, my colleagues from the early days when the risk involved was high and the outcome uncertain. We were a small team, but those first discoveries laid the foundations for what was to come. And I cherish the camaraderie that came from conducting difficult experiments in challenging circumstances together. To the National Science Foundation for its unwavering support of these first effort, efforts, and the Gordon and Betty Moore and John Templeton Foundations for partnering with us to see the full experiment through. And to the wonderful Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. It required great teamwork to achieve success on this grand scale, and it has been a joy and privilege to work with all of you on this project, and in particular to the students and postdocs in the collaboration whose creativity and dedication were essential. To my mentor, Alan Rogers, who showed by extraordinary example how to plan and conduct research and to my family, Elisa, Solomon, and Delilah for their support and patience with an obsession. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you to National Academy of Science for, for this reward. It's, it's really humbling and it's a, it's a great honor and it means a lot to me. And of course, as Shep mentioned in these days, science requires teams to turn dreams into reality. And, and really, uh, imaging a black hole is, is turning science fiction into science reality. And uh, so thanks to you, Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration uh, that is your prize as well. And, and you need a, a personal team indeed. And so thanks a lot to my parents, my wonderful wife and my children who's been with me for all these years and supported me. And, and hope I was a good son and dad and, and husband. And of course, I think we stand on the shoulders of giants, as Chet mentioned. I mean, we have all these medalists before us, 
In fact, the last Dutch scientist to get this uh, reward was Henk van der Hulst, who was thinking of or predicting that uh, cosmic hydrogen would emit radio emission. And that was later discovered, and it was used to map out the structure of our Milky Way and determine our place in this universe, literally. And he made that discovery and this, this idea he had while he was sitting, hiding in a Dutch observatory during Nazi Germany occupation. And when I had this idea of, you know, thinking about this dream about imaging a black hole, I was sitting freely in the German Max Planck Institute. I was moving to the Netherlands. I was welcomed there at a wonderful university. Thank you, Radboud, for welcoming, welcoming me there. And we worked with an international team together in a global collaboration. And so I think we should you know, remind ourselves how, what a privilege it is to live in a free and a peaceful world, at least for us, and to do science. And let's make sure we keep it that way. So my apologies to Shep and Heino. I was supposed to be the person that said what you were getting the medal for. Fortunately, this is a kind of contribution that doesn't need to be explained to anyone since it was uh, on the cover of the New York Times. But basically, this is for their leadership of the ETH collab collaboration that led to the imaging and uh, providing yet another validation of Einstein's general theory of relativity. So next up is the J. Lawrence Smith Medal. This is being awarded to Manakshi Wadwa of Arizona State University for her major contributions to some of the most important problems in cosmochemistry. Her refinement of the uranium lead dating method has led to improved age determinations of meteorites and an enhanced understanding of the solar system history. Her use of other isotopes has revealed the timing of early solar system events. Thank you, President McNutt. Thanks to the Academy for this incredible honor and to my colleagues who nominated me. I'm really humbled when I think of those who were awarded this medal before me. Um, in acknowledgement of the great role that mentorship has played in my professional, scientific, and personal life, I'd like to dedicate this honor to my mentors and to my mentees. Among my mentors, I want to particularly mention Ghislaine Crozaz, Robert Walker, Ernst Zinner, and Gunter Lugmeier. Bob Walker and Ernst Zinner are both former awardees of the J. Lawrence Smith Medal, which makes this rec recognition all the more meaningful to me. I'm fortunate to have worked with some amazing students and postdoctoral researchers, one of whom was among those who nominated me. It's my mentees who've kept me inspired and motivated over the years and they continue to do so. I wanna thank my colleagues at Arizona State University where I've found an incredibly supportive academic home for the last 15 years. And I also thank my colleagues and collaborators beyond ASU, especially in Chicago where I spent some wonderful years before moving to ASU. I wanna acknowledge the support of my family and friends. And I'm particularly thinking of my family and friends in India who are in the midst of the worst of the pandemic right now. It's a reminder of how humanity can only thrive when guided by science and by empathy. And finally, I'm especially grateful for the love and support of my husband, Scott Parazinski, who's been my biggest cheerleader through good and bad times. Thank you again for this great honor. Well, I'm sure we are all sending our very best wishes to everyone in India. The situation there is truly a monumental crisis and we hope the best for your family. So next, I'm very excited to be announcing the inaugural James Prize in Science and Technology Integration. It's being awarded to Elon Klein of Harvard Medical School and Aviv uh, Regev of Gentech Research and Early Development, Genentech, sorry. It has been given for their concurrent development of now widely adopted massively parallel single cell genomics to interrogate the gene expression profiles that define at the level of individual cells, the distinct cell types and metazoan tissues their development in trajectories and disease states, which integrate tools from molecular biology, engineering, statistics, and computer science, 
all required to solve this problem. First, we will hear from Dr. Klein, followed by Dr. Regev. Thank you. I'm deeply honored to receive this award. This prize celebrates integration of disciplines across science and technology. And I hope that with this prize, Aviv Regev and I can represent a community of scientists that have done so, specifically building tools to carry out genome-wide single cell measurements and finding applications for those tools. We now appreciate that diseases such as cancer and infectious diseases can be dissected by holistically analyzing single cells. And this is also true for studying how tissues develop and regenerate. Building these tools require technologies from soft matter physics, molecular biology, and cell biology. And once the data was available, it also opened up new problems in theory and computation. None of this has happened in one lab, but it takes a certain type of environment to effectively integrate technology, theory, and biology. So I'd like to particularly acknowledge my mentor, Mark Kirshner, and my department, the Department of Systems Biology, for creating an environment where creativity and curiosity can thrive. And I feel incredibly lucky to have also worked with students and postdocs who care not only about the science, but also about the environment and culture in which we carry it out. So thank you again. I appreciate this prize. Technology integration together with Alon Klein, and I thank the prize committee and Robert James for his generosity in establishing this prize, and also my family for their unwavering support through many adventures. As Alon said, many prizes focus on discoveries within one field, but this one recognizes that single cell genomics is a new area of biology that was only possible at the intersection of multiple disciplines. We needed biology and math and computation together to lay the scientific motivation and theoretical foundation and data analytics, and engineering made the experiments possible at the scale that was needed to yield deep biological insights. Now, recently, a colleague shared with me this quote from Proust. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscape, but in having new eyes. And for me, that's not just an apt description of the new eyes that single cell genomics has given us for old problems in biology and medicine, but also the many new eyes that were needed in order to make it happen. So I'm especially grateful to the many people with diverse perspectives and expertise who contributed to making single cell genomics a reality, including lab, including lab members at MIT and abroad, many, many collaborators and the entire international community. It's a thrill to see interdisciplinary research recognized and I look forward to all the achievements that this prize will recognize in the future. Well, thank you for those remarks. I'm sure Bob James, if he is listening, would be very thrilled to hear that because Bob comes to this um, medal through oceanography and it's so true in oceanography that you don't discover something new by going back to the same place with the same tools, but by developing new eyes to see new things. So thank you very much. Uh, next up is the Michael and Sheila Held Prize. It's being awarded to Adam W. Marcus of EPFL and Daniel Allen Spielman of Yale University and um, Nikhil uh, Srivastav of the University of California, Berkeley for their breakthrough works on the Cadison singer problem and on Ramujan graphs and the underlying theory that leads to new connections between computer science, mathematics, and physics. We will hear first from Dr. Marcus, followed by Dr. Spielman, and then Dr. Srivastav. Thank you for this award. There are too many people to audibly thank in this short time. So instead, I will do what I tell all of my students to do in situations like these. Put it on a slide. During the few moments that I do have, I would like to single out one person who was instrumental in my lifelong addiction to mathematics, a man by the name of Steve Segur. The last words Steve said to me were, spread the gospel. And in an attempt to honor his wishes, I am pleased to announce that a large portion of this award will be used to endow a fund with the American Mathematical Society in Steve's name. That fund will support future mathematicians and scientists and will hopefully help to continue Steve's legacy of spreading joy through mathematics. Thanks again. I'm very happy to receive the Held Prize for my work with Adam and Nikhil. We worked on these problems for a long time with nothing to publish until the end. And if you're gonna spend a long time working on hard problems, it's good to do it with people you enjoy being around. And I'm really thankful they never gave up. 
I'd like to thank my wife, Donna, for supporting the absurd amount of time that I spend working and for understanding that my choice of leisure activity is often thinking about math. Um, finally, I wanna thank the unknown person who did the work of nominating us and who kept the nomination a secret. So it was a complete surprise when we won. It's a wonderful honor. Uh, so thank you very much to the Held family and to the National Academy for this tremendous honor uh, and for recognizing this work. Um, I want to thank my parents and my sister and the many mentors and teachers uh, that I had during my time at Union College, Yale University, and Microsoft Research India. And especially important among them were uh, Alan Taylor and Peter Heinig, my undergrad advisors, and Dan Spielman, my graduate advisor, who taught me how to do research. Um, it feels strange to receive an award at this particular time, having just been on the phone with relatives and friends in India who are in desperate situations. Uh, that said, I was, I was very glad to hear this morning from Dr. Fauci that the U.S. is considering sending vaccine and supplies to India, and I hope that countries continue to help each other in these crises through, through the well, thank you, all three of you, and you're so right. All of us uh, have to work together to solve this uh, problem in India. Uh, the next award is the NAS Award for Chemistry in Service to Society. It's awarded to Susan Solomon of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for her influential and incisive application of atmospheric chemistry to understand our most critical environmental issues, such as ozone layer depletion and climate change, and for her effective communication of environmental science to leaders to facilitate policy changes. I'm terribly humbled to be receiving this wonderful award today. It's one of the few occasions when it's great to be on Zoom. If I was in person, I would have to be pinching myself to make sure it's real to share the stage with all these incredible people getting all the other awards. I just wanna say how grateful I am and to tell you that this award has very special significance to me in part because my graduate advisor at Berkeley, Harold Johnston was its second recipient way back in 1993. So I think you can all imagine how overwhelming that feels. Um, its significance as an award for service to society is also very meaningful because serving society is what I think understanding ozone depletion and climate change is all about. I especially want to thank the fantastic colleagues and collaborators with whom I've been lucky enough to work over the years. There's no time to name each of them, but please know how much I appreciate them. And lastly, deep thanks to my husband and my stepson, Barry and Casey. Thank you all so very much. Oh, thank you, Susan. Okay, the next is the NAS Award for Scientific Discovery. It's presented this year in astronomy, material science, or physics were the three categories that were considered. And it's awarded to Pablo Perillo Herrero of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology for the discovery of correlated insulator behavior and unconventional superconductivity in magic angle graphene super lattices. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it is a great honor to receive the NAS Award for Scientific Discovery. I want to start by thanking my nominator, Emilio Mendez, and the National Academy and the award committee for selecting me, for selecting my group's research for this award. And I mentioned my, my group because although I stand here as its visible figure, I see this award as reflecting the great work that my graduate students and postdocs at MIT do, for which I feel extraordinarily fortunate, and I want to thank them all. I also want to thank the support of MIT and my wonderful MIT colleagues for you know, all, all what they have done for me during these past 13 years that have enabled the work that led to this award. Next, I would like to thank my parents. They did not have the opportunity of going to college, but they read a lot and cared that I and my brothers received a good education Thank you, mom and dad, for supporting my dreams of studying physics. And finally, I would like to thank my family, and especially my wife, and Empar, who has sacrificed a lot for me to do research at MIT, and my three kids, Marta, Maria, and David, who helped me keep my feet on the ground. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Next up is the NAS Award in Chemical Sciences, and it's awarded to 
Peter Schultz of Scripps Research for his innovative and pioneering contributions at the interface between chemistry and biology, especially for the exploitation of molecular diversity in the synthesis of new medicines and materials and the rational expansion of the genetic code of living organisms. Hi, it's Pete Schultz. I'm really delighted to uh, be the recipient of the National Academy of Sciences Award in Chemical Sciences. Uh, it's a terrific tribute to uh, the accomplishments and all the hard work and talent of all of my current and past co-workers, graduate students, postdocs, colleagues, and collaborators. And it's all, it's working with all of these terrific people that, that really makes my job uh, not only rewarding, but very enjoyable. So thanks again, um, I very much appreciate it. Next up, we have the NAS Award in Molecular Biology. It's being awarded to Joseph D. Mougeot of University of Washington and Howard Hughes Medical Institute for the discovery that bacterial type six secretion systems are a crucial driver of interbacterial competition and the shaping of microbial communities and their potential as antimicrobial effectors. It is a true honor to receive this award from the National Academy of Sciences, which recognizes not only our work, but the incredible cumulative progress of many labs in the area of interbacterial antagonism. Thank you so much to the committee and to Carrie Harwood, Margaret McFall Nye, and Carolyn Bertozzi for supporting my nomination. Maybe the best part of this whole thing is the reflection it brings, and then this unique opportunity to acknowledge at least some of the people who made a difference along the way. I would like to begin by recognizing my scientific mentors, David Patrick and Spencer Anthony Cahill at Western Washington University, who saw beyond my naivete and gave me initial exposure to academic research. Carolyn Bertozzi for being an inspiring leader and for her unflappable support and generosity. And John Mechalanos for creating and sharing the incubator for discovery that is his lab. I am so grateful to the talented and dedicated scientists that have been through my lab over the years, to our network of wonderful collaborators and to my colleagues at the University of Washington. I need to single out Brooke Peterson and Simon Dove, two longstanding colleagues who I all but share a brain with scientifically. On a personal level, I would of course like to thank my family, in particular my wife Malike, for her support and grounding over the years. And I would like to extend my deepest possible gratitude to my parents for sacrificing to give me op opportunities they never had. Finally, I wanna dedicate this award to my father who passed away this year. He instilled in me a fascination for the natural world, the importance of education, and the idea that with grit you can go anywhere in life. Thank you. Thank you. And now we have the NAS Award in the Evolution of Earth and Life, also known as the Mary Clark Thompson Medal. It's being awarded to Xu Hai Xiao of Virginia Tech for his integrated geological, geochemical, and paleontological research on the evolution and radiation of eukaryotes, of algae and of animals in the Ediacaran and Cambrian periods. His leadership and his construction of a scientific and cultural bridge between China and the United States that has greatly benefited both societies. Hello from Blacksburg, Virginia. I would like to thank the National Academy of Sciences for this much appreciated honor. I'm deeply humbled by this recognition, and I have many people to thank. But first and foremost, I would like to thank my mentors in the US and China, my collaborators around the world, my students, postdocs, and colleagues at Virginia Tech, and my family for their guidance and support over many years in the laboratory and in the field, and in my professional and personal life. I would also like to thank many previous recipients of this award for their inspiration. And in particular, I would like to mention the 1936 recipient, Amadeus William Grebel, 
an American geologist who helped found the geology department at Beijing University, where I received my undergraduate training in geological sciences, as well as the 2012 recipient, Andrew Knoll, who guided my PhD study at Harvard University in the 1990s. I'm extremely excited to continue my research to explore the past and to inform the future of our planetary home, the Earth. Thank you very much, and please stay safe. Thank you, Shu Hai. The next up is the NAS Prize in Food and Agricultural Sciences. It's awarded to Christina M. Grosinger of Pennsylvania State University for her innovative and integrative studies of the molecular, physiological, and ecological determinants of the health of managed and wild bees, leveraging this information to develop accessible decision support tools for farmers and conservationists and passionate advocacy and public engagement for pollination. Thank you. It is such an honor to be part of this group of outstanding scientists. When I was finishing my graduate studies in chemical biology, my brother started keeping honeybees and told me amazing stories about their behavior. At the time, new molecular tools were becoming available for non-model systems, so I realized it was the perfect time to study so honeybee sociogenomics. This was a dramatic switch in research focus, and so I was very grateful when Gene Robinson accepted me into his group as a Beckman Institute Fellow now 20 years ago. Since that time, the threats to pollinators have become very clear. With the support of a worldwide network of collaborators, my program has expanded to address these challenges through integrative studies of bee immunology, toxicology, and nutrition. We are now beginning to unravel the effects of land use and climate on change on bee health, and we're making our research usable to stakeholders and policymakers through our online Beescape decision support platform. Thank you again for this honor and for recognizing the importance of pollinators to agricultural systems. And thank you, Christina, for your work on this important problem. Next up is the Pradel Research Award, and it's being awarded to Tiran Moore of Stanford University School of Medicine and Howard Hughes Medical Institute for his transformative contributions to our understanding of visual attention by showing how neural activity in motor regions of prefrontal cortex influences visual representations in the brain. He established a causal link between motor control signals and the neural circuits of visual uh, perception and attention. Well, I'm deeply honored to accept this award from the National Academy of Sciences, and I do so on behalf of all of my students, postdocs, and collaborators over the past years. Working with all of them has been a truly rewarding and enriching experience. In our work, we've sought to understand how neural circuits involved in controlling movements also influence sensory representations. And this work has taught us a great deal about the neural mechanisms that underlie fundamental cognitive functions, such as visual attention. And this insight is proving to be key in the continuing quest to understand the basis of disorders of cognition, such as ADHD. I'd like to also thank Stanford University and HHMI, as well as the NIH for their continued support of our work over many years. And finally, I'd like to thank the National Academy, my nominators, and the selection committee for this honor. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have the Richard Lounsbury Award. It's being awarded to Feng Zheng of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, and the McGovern Institute for Brain Research. It's being awarded for his pioneering achievements in the field of genome editing, including the discovery of novel CRISPR systems and their development as molecular tools. It's a wonderful honor to receive the Lounsbury Award. I'm deeply grateful to the Selection Committee, the Lounsbury Foundation, and the Academy for recognizing our work. This award recognizes the work for my entire lab, for their passion and drive to develop new technologies that can accelerate science, but also help develop new treatments for improving human health. I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge all of my lab members, uh, both past and present, as well as all of my collaborators and colleagues in the CRISPR field. It's been a privilege to work with them, and I have learned a tremendous amount from all of them. I also want to thank my mentors for their guidance and unwavering support to, uh, to help me develop both as a scientist and more importantly, uh, as a person. 
Last but not least, I want to thank my family for their love and also for enabling me to pursue my dreams. Thank you so much again for this tremendous honor. Oh, thank you. Next is the Selman A. Waxman Award in Microbiology. And it's been given to Pascal Cossart of Pasteur Institute and the Académie des Sciences for her pioneering contributions to the field of cellular microbiology and her fundamental work uncovering novel mechanisms that govern the interplay between the pathogenic intercellular bacterium Listeria and its mammalian host, as well as her many contributions to supporting microbiology worldwide. I am truly very honored to receive the Selman Waxman Award in Microbiology 2021, and I thank the jury to have selected me. I am really delighted for several reasons. First, because it is an international prize, which means that my science and all the efforts of my team have crossed the frontiers. Second, because this prize is given by the National Academy of Science, which is highly respected in the whole world. Third, because it is a very prestigious prize in the microbiology community, and when I look at the list of the laureates, I feel very honored to be among this list. Fourth, because it is the first time that this award is given to a European investigator. I am thus proud for my team, for the Pasteur Institute, where I started my career when I came back from the States, from Georgetown University, where I had finished my Master of Science. So thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> durian, durian, Pascal. Okay, next, we have two Troland Research Awards. They will be, um, the first uh, is going to Michael J. Frank, of Kearney Institute for Brain Sciences at Brown University for his seminal theoretical and experimental studies that have shaped our understanding of learning, valuation, and cognitive control in humans and in other animals. Thank you to the Academy, the Prize Committee, and my nominators for this incredible honor. I'm not the first Michael Frank to receive this award, so I also thank my namesake for this bleed over and credit assignment. I thank Randy O'Reilly, my PhD mentor, who taught me to pursue computational approaches to brain science and to understanding the mind without overly fetishizing the mathematics. I thank my colleagues at Brown University and the University of Arizona before that for their unwavering support. I thank the Kearney Institute at Brown for promoting computational approaches to brain science, enabling my lab, the center, and the community more broadly to thrive. I have to thank my Long-term collaborators, David Better, Jim Gold, Roshan Cools, and many, many others, as well as my current and former mentees, who all continually prove to me how much science is really a team sport. Most importantly, I thank my wife, Masha, my kids, Kaya and Noah, my parents, and the entire Frank machine for always showing me what really matters. Thanks again, and stay safe. Thank you. Now we've got the second Trollin Research Award. It's being given to Nicole Rust of the University of Pennsylvania for her fundamental contributions to our understanding of the mechanisms by which the cortex makes use of complex visual information to guide intelligent behavior. So let me just begin by thanking the National Academy and the Selection Committee for this recognition. I'm absolutely honored and flattered to join the list of so many remarkable individuals who have received this award before me. I want to acknowledge all the tremendous individuals who have contributed to the work that's acknowledged here, including the postdocs, graduate students, research assistants, and collaborators I've had the good fortune to work with. I'm particularly grateful to my mentors, Tony Moshin, Eros Simoncelli, and Jim DiCarlo, for not only setting an amazing example of what it means to be a scientist, but also for their belief, support, and encouragement throughout the years. I wanna thank my parents, not only for their support and their belief in me since I began, but also for providing me the type of formative and independent childhood that I think has really determined who I am today. And finally, I wanna thank my family, my daughter, Clara, my son, Hendrik, and my brilliant partner and colleague, Alan, for joining me on this remarkable journey. Thank you. Next up, we have the William and Catherine Estes Award. It's awarded to Charles L. Glasser 
of George Washington University for his contributions to understanding feasible and desirable forms of nuclear arms control and ballistic missile defense in light of a constantly evolving technological frontier. Glasser's work has been influential for its combination of theoretical rigor with a strong appreciation for the technical aspects of nuclear weapons policy. Hello. I would like to thank the National Academy for recognizing my research on U.S. nuclear weapons policy. It is an honor to be included among the many outstanding scholars who have received the Estes Award, especially luminaries Nobel winner Tom Schelling and Robert Jervis. Over the four decades that I've studied nuclear weapons, the world has changed dramatically. During the Cold War, nuclear weapons defined the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union, and the fear of nuclear war was ever present. With the end of the Cold War, nuclear weapons receded into the background of international politics. But now with China's rise and Russia's resurgence, nuclear weapons are once again coming to the top of the international policy agenda. In addition, technology has changed dramatically over these decades and has created new opportunities and also new dangers, many of which will have to be handled in future decades. So far, the world has avoided nuclear war. Academics like to think that we deserve a little bit of credit for this, although we're not really sure. Thank you. And now we come to the culmination of our award ceremony today, the final prize, which is the 2021 National Academy of Sciences Public Welfare Medal. It is being awarded to scientist, physician, and public health leader Anthony S. Fauci. Dr. Fauci's career as a public servant spans more than four decades, and he has advised seven different U.S. presidents, including the current president, Joe Biden. The director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institute of Health, Fauci has played a key role in shaping the federal government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and while leading his uh, institute, he sponsored research efforts to better understand and prevent and treat COVID-19. The Public Welfare Medal was established in 1914 and is the most prestigious award of the National Academy of Sciences. It's presented annually by the Council of the Academy in recognition of distinguished contributions in the application of science for public welfare. Dr. Fauci is being honored for his decades long leadership in combating emerging infectious diseases from the AIDS crisis to the COVID-19 pandemic and for being a clear, consistent and trusted voice in public health. Despite a heavy workload, he continues to promote and reinforce critical public health guidance through numerous media appearances He's always clear and compelling as he informs the public based on the best available science and evidence, all while directing the NIAID research enterprise, treating patients and conducting research in his own laboratory. Throughout his long and distinguished career, his leadership and ingenuity during public health emergencies has saved countless lives here in the US and around the world. Long became for he became a household name for his work on the COVID-19 pandemic. Fauci was a pioneer in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of infectious diseases, helping to steer the nation and the world through many crises, including HIV AIDS, Ebola, the swine flu, and Zika. Fauci was also the principal architect of the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, PEPFAR, a life-saving global program that has accelerated progress towards controlling the HIV AIDS epidemic in more than 50 countries. In recognition of his leadership in PEPFAR, President George W. Bush awarded him the Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. Fauci also contributed to the establishment of the US President's Malaria Initiative in 2005, a program that has greatly reduced the burden of this disease in Africa and in Asia. Dr. Fauci has received 45 honorary doctorate degrees from universities in the United States and abroad, 
and is the author, co-author, or editor of more than 1,300 scientific publications. He is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Medicine, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as other professional societies. In addition to the Presidential Medal of Freedom, Fauci has received numerous other awards and honors, including a recipient of the National Medal of Science, the Mary Woodard Lasker Award for Public Service, and the Canadian Gardner Global Health Award. Most recently, Dr. Fauci's name has transcended, being the identity of an individual to becoming the shorthand for honesty, integrity, forthright speaking, and dedication to mission. Earlier today, Francis Collins talked about the Fauci effect, that many more applicants want to go to medical school because they see, understand, and want to emulate Dr. Fauci. Gina McCarthy, Thank you, former Dr. EPA administrator. Honored. Sorry. Uh, Gina McCarthy, who's the former EPA administrator and current president of the NRCD, recently wrote about what it takes to rebuild public trust in the EPA. And I quote her, she said, um, that begins with naming what I like to call an Anthony Fauci of the environment to head the EPA. Someone who, whether they're a scientist or not, has unassailable credibility among scientists, advocates, and the public. On that basis, if the Fauci is the official unit to measure scientific credibility, I aspire one day to have my own contributions measured in milli Fauci's. Anthony S. Fauci is an American hero who has earned the respect and trust of millions for his no-nonsense approach to the pandemic. We are thrilled to present him with our most prestigious award. Thank you, Dr. McNutt. I am truly honored to accept the 2021 Public Welfare Medal of the National Academy of Sciences and to deliver these remarks at our annual meeting. I understand that I'm receiving this medal for what was described as my decades long leadership in combating emerging infectious diseases from the AIDS crisis to the COVID-19 pandemic, and importantly for being a clear, consistent and trusted voice in public health. So what I would like to do in my remarks is to focus in on both of those. The interactions I've had in my position in combating emerging infectious diseases and how I've tried to balance that to be a clear and consistent and trusted voice in public health through some very difficult experiences that we've had with emerging infectious diseases. And so let us get on with the discussion. Although I had been a senior investigator and ultimately a lab chief at NIAID for 12 years before I became the director of the NIAID, as shown in this NIH record from 1984, I had not been involved very deeply in the issue of emerging and re-emerging infections in general, even though my basic research since 1981 had been involved with HIV AIDS. However, it was the appointment as director of NIAID that got me intimately involved in the entire concept of the risk of emerging infections. As I wrote several years later in this review article in Lancet with my colleagues, Dr. Morins and Fokers. The very first time I testified before the United States Congress, I brought a map up on a poster and I spoke about the emerging infection that we were dealing with at that time, namely HIV. I use this map repetitively in the over 250 times that I've testified before the United States Congress, either the House or the Senate in multiple committees. And I add sometimes one, sometimes two or three infections to this. Sometimes they're trivial and curiosity and sometimes they have a major impact. This is the last shot of a poster I showed just this past year in testifying before the Congress with COVID-19. As it turns out, 
my position has uniquely, just by a set of circumstances, put me in relatively close contact, some more than others, with seven presidents of the United States, beginning with Ronald Reagan. But there was one principle that permeated my relationship with each and every one of these men, and that was related to advice that a dear friend of mine who had actually spent some years in the Nixon White House before he went to another position told me as I was getting ready to go in to see Ronald Reagan on the first visit to advise him in 1985, shortly after assuming the position of director. And what my dear friend told me is that when you open the door to the West Wing lobby and enter the White House, always remind yourself that this may be the last time that you will enter the building. Because if you get captivated by the awe of the place and become starstruck, leading to your focusing on getting invited back, you may be hesitant to tell the president something that he or she may not want to hear, such as an inconvenient truth. Better to maintain your integrity and tell the inconvenient truth, even if it means you're never getting invited back. Well, my tenure into this particular arena started with Ronald Reagan. The issue at hand at the time was HIV AIDS. We know in 1981, just months after his inauguration, these two MMWRs signaled the beginning of what was going to be a historic global pandemic. I felt that we did not put enough emphasis on using the president's bully pulpit to call attention to this emerging plague. And I actually explicitly mentioned to the president that it would be important that he speak about that. He did not respond in a negative way. And so I told him an inconvenient truth, but there were no negative consequences, at least not from him. But the activist community got up in arms and made this a very difficult situation. Actually, for me also, because I was associated with the federal government. An example of speaking truth to the president, but him not reacting in a negative way, even though it would have been really, I think, important from a public health standpoint had he listened. Next came George H. W. Bush, who I developed a very interesting and long lasting until his death friendship. He took AIDS in a different perspective than Ronald Reagan. He came to the NIH multiple times visited, understood the disease, and the funding for AIDS research continued to go up to the point where it can maintains a significant portion of the budget. I had to tell him some inconvenient truths about, again, what we should be doing regarding the resources. He responded, I believe, well, but not well enough for the activists to be satisfied. Nonetheless, our relationship grew and the advances in science that began there have now transformed this disease with some of the most elegant science, particularly in the arena of treatment, which has transformed the lives of persons living with HIV. My next interaction was that was with William J. Clinton, Bill Clinton. Again, there was HIV AIDS permeated, but we had another a group of emerging infectious diseases. There really was never any situation where there was a conflict there. And the only quote inconvenient truth that I told him, which was not really anything very serious from the standpoint of a pushback was that we absolutely needed more resources, which in fact, he together with the Congress gave us. But one truth I did tell him that he responded in a very positive way was in a visit to the White House in December of 1996. And here I am with Harold Varmus explaining some of the recent advances in the pathogenesis of HIV. He asked me why 15 years later, 
from the beginning, we did not see or have a vaccine for HIV. And it turned out, I told him we needed a vaccine research center because we needed to bring people together working and synergizing on the same project. I would have thought he may have said that it was a little bit inappropriate for me to be asking him that in the Oval Office, but as it turns out, to our great pleasure and surprise, five months later, he announced that there was gonna be a vaccine research center at the NIH. And in fact, we have it not only now for HIV, but extraordinary advances that have been made in a number of vaccines, including a pivotal role in the development of a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. Next came my relationship with George W. Bush. Again, HIV AIDS played an important role, but we also had the anthrax bioterrorism. We had H5N1 influenza. We had SARS. One of the things I did tell him, which was the truth, which he responded very well to, and that is that as a rich country, we were doing extraordinary things with people with HIV by the drugs. He himself had come to that conclusion before I even told him. And so we worked together on something that I feel is one of the most important things I've done in my entire career, which was to work with the president and being given by him the opportunity to be one of the principal architects of the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, which started off with $15 billion over five years, but has been responsible after he announced it in January 28th of 2003, that over the last now, I would say 18 years, it has been clearly the most important public health endeavor from a global standpoint that we've ever done, responsible for saving estimated 14 million lives with 17.2 million people receiving antiretroviral drugs, 50 million people being tested and 25 million medical male circumcisions. That was something that a discussion we had turned into something extraordinary. Next, Barack Obama. Again, Barack Obama was faced with many emerging infectious diseases, starting off with the pandemic influenza, the first pandemic of the 21st century, and Zika, and then Ebola. Again, there was never anything that I had to do personally with him that was pushed back in any way. So it was not a situation where I needed to tell him things that I would be concerned that if he got upset, he wouldn't ask me back. And then came Donald Trump's uh, tenure. Again, there were multiple emerging infectious diseases. I had virtually nothing to do with Donald Trump until COVID-19 in the last year of his presidency. This was the first Washington Post and science announcement of this new infection. SARS-CoV-2, which we all know now, you don't need me to tell you, has been historically the most devastating pandemic of a respiratory disease that we've had in over 100 years since the historic pandemic of influenza in 1918. These are the three major surges that we've experienced. Look on the right-hand part of the slide. We are now still threatened by the fact that we've plateaued at a level which is dangerous. And we now know, even though we're doing well with vaccines, which I'll get into in a moment, the fact is the cases are creeping up. The good news is that in record time, unprecedented in the history of vaccinology, we developed a vaccine which was less than 11 months from the time the virus was identified to the time we were putting successful highly efficacious vaccines into the arms of individuals. However, my experience here really tested the advice that my friend gave me that I showed you in one of the first slides. Because even though we were successful in getting vaccines, and here is three separate vaccines 
Moderna, BioNTech, Pfizer, J&J, which have really been extraordinarily important, there was a considerable, I would say, disagreement with some of the convenient truths that I had to tell. We had the breakthrough of the year. It should have been all success. But as it turned out, it wasn't because there was the conflict that became very, very public as shown here on some of the news that was reported. Fauci throws cold water on Trump's declaration that malaria drug chloroquine is a game changer. I took no great pleasure in doing that, but it was very important for me to be public about that, even though it directly conflicted the president. I had to disagree with him when he said we were turning the corner when I knew that we were actually going to surge. And things got really testy when he made statements like, people are tired of hearing him and all of those idiots on coronavirus. And then finally, towards the end of that year, the threat to actually fired me. So as it turns out, the issue of never getting ass back was now up front and seeing me. But as it turned out, presidencies change. And fortunately, I have gotten ass back and feel very privileged now to be the chief medical advisor to President Joseph Biden. And as I'm speaking to you now, we are in the process of having an important race between the implementation of these vaccines and the possibility of getting another surge. So I'll close by once again thanking the Academy for bestowing upon me this public welfare award. I have tried very hard and I hope that I have been a clear, consistent and trusted voice in articulating matters of public health. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tony, for those really wise words. The graph you showed showing that each time there's been a resurgence, the resurgence has been worse and it goes down to a higher baseline is certainly of grave concern and should encourage all of us to make sure that everyone we know, all of our loved ones and ourselves get vaccinated as quickly as possible. It, as you say, it's a race. It's a race between the vaccine coming back in more virulent forms and us getting it wiped out through vaccination. So that brings us to the end of today's program. I wanna thank everyone who joined us and do one last congratulations to all of today's medalists. One thing um, I will say is that normally we would be uh, excusing ourselves from the auditorium to all go toast you and have uh, wonderful uh, appetizers, which we unfortunately can't do, but we're hoping to invite you all back next time we can meet in person so we can give you all the toasts that you deserve. So thank you everyone today and congratulations to all the medalists.